Recording in progress. Confirm me, am I audible and the PPT is visible? Anita, just confirm me, am I audible to you and the PPT is visible? Okay. Let's wait for one minute and let us start. Good morning. Did you revise those yesterday's class? If you find any difficulties means you can ask me now. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, in yesterday's class, we have completed about mouthparts of insects, useful and harmful insects, also metamorphosis in insects. Clear? In today's class, we are going to finish this arthropoda by seeing this apiculture and sericulture in India and crustacean larva. Okay? Fine. Uh, in yesterday's class, we have seen a lot of types uh, which is undergoing by arthropoda, arthropodans animals. This particularly metamorphosis. What are all the metamorphosis stages uh, undergone by <coughs> all those insects? First thing is no metamorphosis or a metabolic animal. You have to remember two names. No metamorphosis is also called as what type of development. Now, picture as well as the examples. And what are all the lifestyle, life stages which has been undergoing in this a metamorphosis development. Also, incomplete metamorphosis is also called as the hemimetabolous development. And again, the examples most of the flies are undergoing this hemimetabolous development. Also, what are all the three stages? See, when it comes to the incomplete metamorphosis, there are three stages involving in this type of metamorphosis process. So, what are all the three stages? Egg, larva, and the adult. Okay, or we can say egg, nymph, and the adult. Okay, which stage is absent in hemimetabolous or incomplete metamorphosis means pupa stage. Now, gradual metamorphosis is also called as the pyrometabolous development. And what is that example? Grasshoppers, aphids, sting, bugs, and the etc. So here in gradual metamorphosis, what is there in present? Pupa stage is again absent, but the young nymph is converted into the later nymph. And later nymph is the one going to convert it to an adult form with some of the modifications in their structure. What is the name of the process undergoing by the young nymph to transform into an adult? When it comes to the arthropoda, what is the name of the process that transform the young nymph to the adult form? Just answer for this question. What is the name of the process? Is it? What is what is molting? What is molting? This is irrelevant. What the what is the answer you have given is irrelevant. But what is molting? Molting is a process which which is which is nothing but which is going to stretch off some of their parts and the young nymph is converted into the later nymph. For that, molting has been taken place. And in the process of, again, through the process of molting, this later nymph is transforming into an adult form. Clear? 
Now, complete metamorphosis or holometabolous development. Here, a complete four developmental stages have been seen here. Egg, larva, pupa and the adult. Okay, here the pupa has been covered themselves within the secreted case which is called as the puparium. After in a favorable condition, the puparium will be break out and the larva which is present inside the puparium come outside as an adult. Clear? And what is the base example? Housefly, mosquito and butterfly. Clear? Right. Now, the most important area when it comes to metamorphosis is hormonal control. Okay. What is the name of the hormones they are, which are involved in the process of metamorphosis? Metamorphosis, it is also called as a post-embryonic growth, which means what? What are all the life stages has been happened before it has been come it has been transformed or formed into a matured adult form. Before the formation of matured adult form, what are all the things happened before that? Everything will be called as what? Post-embryonic growth of insect. In most of the higher organisms, these metamorphoses are completely under the control of hormones. And what are the hormones involved in this metamorphosis? Brain hormone, prothoraxicotropic hormone, prothoraxic gland hormone and juvenile hormone. Okay, so the first one is brain hormone. This brain hormone is secreted by the neurosecretory cells of the brain. Okay, first thing, this hormone is secreted by which cells? So, the first point you have to take a note of is this. Neurosecretory cells of the brain is the cells going to secrete the hormone called the brain hormone. But the chemical nature of this particular hormone is lipid. This hormone majorly consists of lipid. It is lipid in nature. Now, what is the function of this particular brain hormone? This is the hormone going to activate the carpora cardiaca. Okay, carpora cardiaca. This is the one going to initiate the metamorphosis process. Now, prothoraxicotropic hormone. Again, this is the this is also secreted by carpora cardiaca. Now, this carpora cardiaca secrete the prothoraxicotropic hormone. Now, this prothoraxicotropic hormone stimulates the prothoraxic glands. Clear? The, it is the one going to stimulate the prothoraxic glands. Now, this prothoraxic gland hormone is secreted by the paired bilateral sheet of the cells in the thorax constitute the prothoraxic glands. Now, chemically, it is egg disown. The most important questionable area is this. Chemically, it is egg disown. The hormone, it is known to trigger molting as it acts on the tissues to promote all the changes characterizing a mold. So, the process of molting, molting happens only under the control of this particular hormone. What is the name of the hormone? Prothoraxic gland hormone. Chemically, it is egg disown. Again, majorly a lipid. Clear? Now, Juvenile hormone. It is secreted by another component of the retrocerebral complex called the carpora alleata. See, in December 2023. December 2023. Afternoon shift. In the CSIR UGC exam. Net Life Sciences exam has asked this particular question. Juvenile hormone is the one, it is secreted by, okay, so, just have a look at it, okay, in the, in the last 20, uh, in the last December they have come, conducted one exam, right, CSIR, UGC, NET, in that particular exam they have asked this question, that much importance is this question, so, make a note of it. Juvenile hormone is secreted by which thing? Which component? Carpora alleata. Okay, chemically is unsaponifiable, non-sterolic lipid. It is made up of, it is, uh, it is not made up of a steroid component. 
clear now this hormone regulates the morphogenesis so promotes the metamorphosis that is development of larva into an adult through the pupal stage okay this is the one majorly controls the morphogenesis which means changes in their morphological characteristics clear so when it comes to the hormones what are all the things you have to remember is main first and foremost thing which hormone is secreted by which type of cells in case of brain hormone it is secreted by the neurosecretory cells of the brain in case of prothoraxicotropic hormone it is secreted by the corpora cardiaca and in the prothoraxicotropic hormone is secreted by the cells which is present in the thorax region now juvenile hormone is secreted by the corpora alata clear and what is their chemical nature of their hormone it um, the brain hormone is majorly a lipid clear and prothoraxic uh, prothoraxic gland hormone is chemically it is adenosine juvenile hormone it is not made up of a steroid okay it is made up of either protein or uh, carbohydrate like a protein okay now that's all about the hormonal control of the metamorphosis so we have completed the metamorphosis process so answer for this question when an immature insect undergoes transformation from a larva to an adult is called first slide this is the one you're asking correct okay see metamorphosis we have studied about metamorphosis or the post embryonic growth of an insect what are all the stages what are all the stages before the adult, the larval stages has been converted into a matured adult form what are all the things happened before a complete growth of an individual that will be said to be as a metamorphosis process so it can be called as the post embryonic growth which means what the embryo has been formed after the formation of embryo if it is uh, happening if this process has been happened before the formation of embryo means then we can call them as a pre embryonic growth but this metamorphosis of insects in the life stages of insects it is it is happening only after the formation of embryo so we can call them as a post embryonic growth okay when it comes to the higher organisms with respect to this metamorphosis particularly in the higher organisms these process are completely under the control of hormones okay so what are all the hormones going to influence this process of metamorphosis means brain hormone prothoraxicotropic hormone prothoraxic gland hormone and juvenile hormone okay these are all the four types of hormone going to influence the process of metamorphosis clear so the first hormone is brain hormone it is secreted by the see when it comes to the hormone the first thing you have to remember is number of name of the cells which is going to secrete this particular hormone so the brain hormone is the one secreted by the neurosecretory cells of the brain here now the second thing you have to keep in mind is what is their chemical nature of that particular hormone chemically it is lipid here now what is the function of the hormone this is the third point you have to remember the hormone serves to activate the corpora cardiaca okay the hormone brain hormone is the one going to activate the corpora cardiaca this corpora cardiaca is the one it is the it is the structure which is present in the brain a retro cerebral complex of the stomatogastric nervous system it is going to stimulate this particular nerves okay now the second hormone is prothoraxicotropic hormone the brain hormone is the one going to activate this particular corpora cardiaca and this corpora cardiaca when it is stimulated by that uh, that brain hormone the um, this corpora cardiaca see brain hormone is stimulating the corpora cardiaca and this corpora this brain hormone is going to activate this particular corpora cardiaca now this corpora cardiaca in turn it is going to secrete the prothoraxicotropic hormone okay 
right this prothoraxicotropic is the hormone going to activate the cells which is present inside in the thorax again that cell is the one going to stimulate or synthesize or secrete the prothoraxic gland hormone chemically this prothoraxic gland hormone it is exdisone this will be your important question exdisone now this exdisone is the one to trigger the molting process as it acts on the tissues to promote all the changes characterizing a mold so molting is an important process we know that molting is a by this process only they are going to gain some of the structure and lose some of the structure their body parts will be changed and that particular process is said to be as a molting and the main important hormone going to influence this process called molting is prothoraxic gland hormone Yeah. Now, juvenile hormone in the December 2023, we have got a question from the CSIR UGC net life sciences exam. Okay, with respect to carpora alata. Okay, juvenile hormone is secreted by carpora alata. The question has been stated from here. See, so that much importance is this hormonal control. So, juvenile hormone it is secreted by the cells called carpora alata. now it is not made up of a steroid it can be made up of a carbohydrate or protein or it or we can say carbohydrate and protein for example glycoprotein now this uh, juvenile hormone plays a major role in the metamorphosis process that is from the life development of larva into an adult through the stage intermediate stage is setting set uh, said to be as the pupa stage clear that's all about the hormonal control are you clear alita anshnelu are you clear okay what about the other who have asked doubts good okay fine so let us uh, come back to the question section a uh, when an immature insect immature insect undergoes transformation from a larva to an adult it is said to be as which process camouflage metamorphosis embryonic development bioluminescence process so the answer will be metamorphosis process so this is an exact definition of this particular process camouflage is nothing but it is an adaptive mechanism it is act as a protective mechanism to protect themselves from the predator that will be the different embryonic development it is um, the embryo the development of embryo bioluminescence which is uh, nothing but an insects which emit some of the light in their body that is it is a bioluminescence so the perfect answer for this question is metamorphosis now all the names below are included in the types of metamorphosis except a metabolic metamorphosis gradual metamorphosis incomplete metamorphosis oblique metamorphosis we have studied four different types of metamorphosis very good and what is the other metamorphosis which is not mentioned here in place of oblique metamorphosis what has to be come gradual incomplete a metabol a metabol a metabolic development and another types of metamorphosis is what as i said as i explained you before the names is also very important clear no metamorphosis or a metabolic development clear incomplete metamorphosis or the pauro metabolic sorry a incomplete metamorphosis incomplete metamorphosis it is also called as the hemi metabolic development now gradual metamorphosis also called as the pauro metabolic development complete metamorphosis or the holo metabolic development okay so the names are very important don't uh, take lightly okay another word for metamorphosis is evolution change modeling and survival very good it is change what about the 
ఆంజనేయులు ఆన్సర్ ఫర్ దిస్ క్వశ్చన్ హౌ మెనీ స్టేజెస్ ఆర్ దర్ ఇన్ ద ఇన్కంప్లీట్ మెటామార్ఫసిస్ సో దిస్ ఇస్ వాట్ ఐ హ్యావ్ సెట్ ఇన్కంప్లీట్ కంప్లీట్ గ్రాజువల్ ఆర్ ఎ నో మెటామార్ఫసిస్ వాట్ ఎవర్ బి ద టైప్ యూ హ్యావ్ టు అండర్స్టాండ్ వాట్ ఆర్ ఆల్ ద స్టేజెస్ హ్యావ్ బీన్ ఇన్వాల్వ్ దేర్ దట్ ఈస్ అ బిగ్ పార్ట్ సో ద ఆన్సర్ ఫర్ దిస్ పర్టికులర్ క్వశ్చన్ ఇస్ త్రీ అండ్ వాట్ ఈస్ ద స్టేజెస్ ఎగ్ larva and adult which stage is absent here which stage is absent here very good in case of uh, the pupa is present yes egg larva pupa and adult if if four stages have been involved in that particular metamorphosis then what we can call them as they we can call them as complete metamorphosis here yeah? now next question in incomplete metamorphosis the eggs of in, in eggs of insects hatches into which life stages and this like it looks like a small adults we can call them as a nymph okay fine which is the type of metamorphosis which have total four stages that are egg larva pupa and last one adult complete incomplete partial and half metamorphosis very good what it is called complete metamorphosis what is also called as the complete metamorphosis complete metamorphosis is also called as what holo metabolis development incomplete metamorphosis is also called as the hemi metabolis development partial metabolism there is nothing called as the partial metabolis metamorphosis and nothing called as the half metamorphosis we have a metabolis development and holo metabolis development and pauro metabolis development now in the complete metamorphosis which of the following is the larval stage of insect in complete metamorphosis which of the following is larval stage of the insects what is it caterpillar see caterpillar is a larval stages of butterfly okay maggots is the bat it is it is also a larval stage of many flies grubs it is also a larval stages of many insects clear so caterpillar is not only the larval stages of insects it is the larval stages of butterfly clear so all of them will be the larval stages of insects when it comes to the complete metamorphosis good very good now state the following statement is true or false during complete metamorphosis larva don't eat while larva inside the cocoons inside their cocoons during a complete metamorphosis we have studied just take example butterfly caterpillar is their larval stage caterpillar don't eat while larva inside their cocoons when larva inside their cocoon whether it is going to feed or not yes exactly the answer will be true now the frog undergoes a complete metamorphosis and in which stage is emerges from the egg which lives in water breathe through gills has a tail exam uh, option is egg adult form tadpole and frog see the frog undergoes a complete metamorphosis okay which stage emerges from the egg which lives in water breathe through, breathe through gills has a tail in it very good tadpole exactly okay fine next in the types of metamorphosis a complete metamorphosis is also called as 
in the type of metamorphosis, a complete metamorphosis is also called as the holometabolous development. Okay, now, yeah. Which of the following hormone regulates growth and metamorphosis in insects? We have studied all the hormones, right? We have studied all the hormones, but the base hormone is brain hormone. Why I am saying brain hormone is because it is the one going to stimulate the carpora cardiaca. Only then the process will continue. Okay. So the answer for this question is brain hormone because all the hormone are going to involved in the metamorphosis process. Okay, particularly in insects, this brain hormone plays a crucial role. Now, hormone helping insects metamorphosis is which hormone? Thyroxin, egdisone, pheromone, all of these. Think and answer for this question. Very good. The answer for this question is egdisone. Now, that's all about the questions and we have completed all those things. The only leftover part is, what is it? Crustacean larva and sericulture and apiculture. Now, I'm going to explain this larva of crustaceans, an important area. First, take your pen and paper and just write it down. It has a direct and indirect development. See, when it comes to the crustacea, it has both direct and indirect development. But... The indirect development is predominant in nature. Direct development means straight away the young ones gives rise to an adult form without any larval stages. In case of indirect development, larval stages. Many larval stages are there in their life cycle. So this is the first point you have to take down. And the second point is list of larva seen in the crustaceans. Nauplius larva, metanauplius larva, Protozoia larva and zoia larva, cypress, mysis or cysopod, megalopa larva, phylozoma, alima. So, these are all the nine larval stages seen in the crustaceans. So, what are all the things you have to remember is this name of these larval stages. And the third important point you should keep in mind is all the, the, the take example for uh, Cyclopus. See, we can say cyclopus. The cyclopus can be undergo from the uh, undergo some of the larval stages, and finally, one of any particular larval stages will give rise to an adult. No doubt in that. But this cyclopus will not undergo all these nine larval stages during their lifetime. Okay, any one or two. Okay, but these nine stages can be seen in the larval stages of crustaceans. If, if you take a particular animal, it is not necessary to undergo all these nine types of larval stages during the life cycle. I think you are uh, clear what are the statements I have mentioned. Okay. Right. So the first larval stage is Naplius larva. So the question can be directly thrown on you, uh, throw at you is from their characteristic features. Naplius larva is known for its simplest eye. Okay, the most important characteristic features of Naplius larva is a simplest eye. It has a simplest eye. Okay, the simplest and commonest type of larva found in the marine crustaceans and few malacostricans. Now, it is an earliest and basic larva. <clears throat> is a basic larva and a three indistinct regions and the three regions are predominant in this particular larval state. What does it mean? A single median eye. It has a single median eye. This is said to be as a nauplius larva. Clear? Now, three pairs of jointed appendages. Here one pair and here one pair and here one pair. Three pairs of jointed appendages. We know that arthropoda is then as the name suggests, the name of arthropoda, it means jointed appendages. So obviously the larval stages also possess jointed appendages. But the number will vary based on the animals. The three pairs of jointed appendages is meant to do their own function. And the first one is uniramus antennales. It can act as a sense organ, balancing organ. 
and the second one is biramus antennae and it is said to be as a locomotor organ so each appendages will destine to do their own function now mandibles mandibles it is present with the antennae may share for the food collection so these are all the points you have to keep in mind and what are all the examples brachiopods brachiopods is the order seen under the arthropoda in the bra I mean brachiopods this larval stage is called the napleus larva will be will be a larval stage in brachiopods after the egg has been hatched out the egg, after the egg has been hatched out it has been developed into one larval stage that is nothing but a nauplius stage and this this nauplius stage directly gives into an adult form okay this is why i have said the brachiopod it is not necessary to undergo all these nine larval stages okay any of the larval stages or any two or three larval stages it is only two to three will be seen in those particular animal particularly in the brachiopod the egg will be developed into which larval stage nauplius larva and nauplius larva will be developed into one adult larva particularly in the brachiopods See, in the brachiopods, the nauplius will be developed straight away into the adult. But in most other crustaceans, it may give rise to many intermediate larval forms, such as metanauplius, protozoa larva, soya larva, and mysis larva. Clear? Any doubts with respect to this? We have no doubts. Just look at the second larval stage. The nauplius larva will develop into an advanced stage. Next to next to next advanced uh, stage after nauplius stage is metanauplius larva. See, it is the later nauplius instar and result by the process of molting and growth. See the larval stages which has been developed from their their form to the next form and that next form into their later form everything will be happening only through the process of molting okay so when it comes to the arthropoda you have to remember the name called the molting or the process called the molting it is very important now the body is developed into a Cephalothorax. The word cephalo means head, thorax means a throat region and an elongated abdomen are terminated into a caudal folks. The name caudal refers to the tail area. Basically, besides three, uh, these pairs of uh, nauplius appendages, see, we have studied these three, uh, there are three appendages in this particular nauplius larva. So, in addition to this three pairs of nauplius appendages, it also bears a rudiment of four pairs of appendages and two pairs of maxillae and two pairs of maxillipedes of an adult. See, this is the structure of the metanauplius larva. And this is the nauplius larva. Okay, see the how the nauplius larva is very simple, but metanauplius is a little bit complicated. It is a little bit gain some of the structures after the nauplius larva. So that we are saying this as a metanauplius larva. Now the second, uh, the third larval stage is called the protozoa larva. So the best example for the protozoa larva is prawns and the suggested decapods. Clear? Now the uh, earliest nauplius by growth and molting develops into the protozoa larva. Based on the animal, this nauplius larva can be converted into either as a metanauplius larva or it can be converted into a protozoa larva. Based on the animals, it will vary. Now, this body will be divisible into body segmented cephalothorax covered with a small carapace and a slender abdomen and a tail region. But there is no appendages will be seen in here. There is no segment seen in here. This is the characteristic features of protozoa. There is a single median nauplius eye is, will be present there and the appendages, what are all the appendages we have seen in the nauplius, all, the, all will be seen in here. Now, it consists of antennules, antennae, mouth parts, first and the second maxillary. And this can be modified into the zoya larva. So, the, lar the protozoa uh, zoya larva, through the process of molting, it has been converted into the zoya larva. 
Now, the example for the zoya larva is decapods. Except penny suggested hatching takes place at the zoya stage. Now, the uh, zoya has a broad cephalothorax and a curved abdomen which assists in swimming and provided with a forked tail zone. Helmet-like carapace bears two long spines. See the structure of this particular zoya larva. It has a spines with it and it has a rostrum for the digestion and true lateral spines often met with. And a pair of large stalked movable compound eyes are present. In the zoya larva, the eyes have been well developed from the simple eye to the compound eye. So you have to remember zoya larva as an, a perfect eye to it. In addition to the proteozoal appendages, these appears to be the, there are appears to be the thoracic appendages. See, napleus larva can be converted into either metanapleus or the zoya larva, uh, protozoia larva. Now, the zoya larva is compulsory. It has to be developed from which larval stage? Protozoia larva. Clear? No. Biramus maxillipase, it is used for which of the following function? They can be asked like that, a question. Biramus maxillipase is meant for the process of swimming. Okay, now the next larval stage is citrus. The example is Cirripedia and example Lepas or the Saculina. Now, the la napleus larva passes into the cypress stage. In this particular Cirripedia, the napleus larva directly converted into the cypress stage. Now, this is the uh, characteristic features of the larval stage. The body and appendages are enclosed within a bivalve vessel provided with adductor muscle as seen in the ostracode adult cypress. So you have to remember the cypress have been developed from the larval stage called the napleus larva. It has a cement gland in it. So this is the unique feature seen, or seen in the cypress. So you have to make remember. All other cephalic appendages with a compound eye only except antenna are present. All the cephalic appendages will be present except the antennae. Okay. Six pairs of biramous thoracic limbs are formed in the abdomen which has a segment up to four to five. This is a characteristic features of cypress larva. And the sixth larval stage is mysis or the sisopod. This is the structure of the mysis and the sisopod. And this can be seen in the decapod, spinous, that is pawn, prong. Okay. Now, uh, lobster zoya is modified into mysis or the sisopod larva. It bears 13 pairs of appendages and resembles adult mysis. It has a five pairs of posterior biramus thoracic appendages. This point is an important point. Now, abdomen is in posterior similar to that of adult with five pairs of uh, biramus pleopods, a pair of uropods and telson. See, what I am suggesting is it is very difficult for you to uh, remember all the characteristic features. What I suggest to do is when you remember the napleus larva, just look at the example and keep the diagram, keep the picture in your mind, okay, so that it will help you in the examination. By seeing this uh, picture and their body path, you can easily derive their characteristic features. See, we have a median eye, we have an antennule here, and one pair is meant for the antenna. And the other pair is meant for the digestion that is mandible and the rest of the other uh, thing which is considered as a uh, for balancing organ. Clear? And the locomotory organ. Like in the same way, you have to remember the metanapleus. Here, what are all the extra features have been developed besides those three appendages. We have maxilla, maxilla piece, mandible, caudal fork, abdomen. So these uh, body parts and their picture, if you remember this means the characteristic features you should not read in the theory part. Okay. So for this topic, diagram will help you. Okay. This, is, this, this will be the only shortcut. Now.
see mice's larva it, in some lobsters mice marks the beginning of their life uh, history as the nauplius and the zoya larva okay now megalopa larva we can the best example is crabs so what are all the things here present here is 13 pairs of appendages six pairs of pleopods and through the process of ingress nauplius stage is passed within the egg which hatches into a zoya larva then by molting process megalopa to be metamorphosed into an adult so here in crab metamor uh, megalopa is the larval stage which is going to convert into an adult form in hermit crab the glucotheo a uh, glucotho uh, corresponds to a megalopa with symmetric abdomen and the swimming pleopods just look at the picture and keep in mind the body parts philosoma see how philosoma is present here larva of palinurus the spiny crab or rock lobster is called as the philosoma so the name suggests the name means a glass crab is it to be as what a glass crab it is a modified mice stage so you have to remember mice is the one modified into the philosoma it has been large flattened head like uh, head like and delicate and glassy the body is distinguished into head transparent thorax and the abdomen and the eyes are not simple here here the eyes are compound in nature and stalk out of six pairs of thoracic appendages the first or maxillipeds are rudimentary which means it is not completely well developed second are uniramus and third would be the biramus succeeded by three pairs of segments of long biramus legs when the segment is there but limbless abdomen in the abdomen region there is no limb will be seen here but it is segmented before reaching an adult stage it undergoes several moltings this will be the important point every larva will undergo a uh, molting process definitely but particularly philosoma now alaima is the larva it is a modified form of zoya larva so you have to remember protozoa is the one gives gives rise to the zoya larva and zoya larva is the one gives rise to an alaima larva so this is also an important thing this is how you have to compare and read this uh, larval stages of crustaceans and uh, malaco strike an example squilla which is hatches from the egg region it is in the pelagic form with glassy transparency have a slender body it bears a short and broad carapace cephalic appendages but only first two are thorax sequence these things are not necessary a six appendage abdomen with four to five pairs of pleopods is present it differs from zoya this is an important point how it can we know that zoya larva is the one modified into alaima larva and how it has been different from the zoya larva here it is it has a well formed the uh, second milling maxillipeds and armature of the telza clear fine this is about the larval stages of crustaceans so when it comes to the larval stages if you find difficulty to read all the characteristic features for each larval stage just remember the picture okay and keep in mind the body parts so picture plays an important role and how it has been differentiated so first thing when it comes to the crustacean larva is it can undergo both direct and indirect development what is it first thing you have to keep in mind is direct and indirect development and the second thing is what are all the nine larval stages which has been seen in the larva of the crustaceans and the third important point you have to remember is it is not necessary for an individual to undergo all these types of nine in uh, nine uh, larval stages okay it is in uh, it is unwanted and it is not necessary okay for directly the egg has been hatch out of the larva naplius larva straight away the naplius larva gives rise to an adult form okay 
and in some of the animals this nauplius will be developed into a metanauplius or this nauplius can be developed into a protozoa larva and you have to remember how this has been differentiated from the zoe nauplius larva and how it has been differentiated from the protozoa larva and we know that from the proto and another important point the fourth important point you have to remember is which larval stages gives rise to which larval stages Naplius is the one who gives rise to metanaplius. And again, naplius is the one who gives rise to protozoa. And proterozoa gives rise to a zoya larva. And cypress is the one who gives this naplius is again gives rise to the cypress larva. And mysis la are physopod larva. It has been uh, this is the one give modified into the mysis. Wait. Zoya larva, see. Zoya larva is the one gives rise to the mysis or physopod larva and megalopa larva is again from the zoya larva it has been metamorphosis into the megalopa larva. Now phylozoma, how this phylozoma has been? There it is from the mysis stage. From the mysis stage this phylozoma larva has been developed. Alema larva again from the zoya larva, alema larva will be developed. See, the zoya larva will be developed into an alema larva. Again, the zoya larva will be developed into the mysis or somewhat. So, you have to remember, based on the type of organisms, this larval stages have been varied. Okay? In some, it, this nauplius will be gives rise to metanauplius. In some, the nauplius larva will be gives rise to the protozoa larva. It is not necessary for that particular individual to undergo all these nine types of larval stages. It is unnecessary. So that's all about the larval stage. These are all the things you have to remember and the most important thing is example. Okay, fine. Now, coming to the questionable area. Alary muscles in insects refers to, I didn't explain you this, but just keep in mind that alary muscles, it is alary. In insects, it refers to the heart muscles. Okay. So the answer for this question is heart muscles. And the second question is, and in insects, each compound eye consists of small units. We know that compound eye is very, very, very important. I have mentioned, if you have remembered, just answer for this question. In insects, each compound eye consisting of small units, which is called as omatidia, corneal lens, lenticular nails, pterostigma. Just tell me. Let me check your listening skill. I have mentioned you this particular word when I teach you. Nobody remember, right? See, compound eye, uh, there is two types of eye, simple eye and compound eye. Okay, simple eye, we know that it is very, very simple as the name suggests. And in case of compound eye, it is made up of smaller units, like nephrons is the functional unit of kidney, like that. Compound eye, it is made up of many small units and that is nothing but called omatidia. Clear? I think nobody has been... Uh, Scroll the pages which I have sent you yesterday, PPT. I have posted the PPT in, a, uh, in the group right yesterday. But nobody have been scrolled even the pages. If you see the pages, then you can easily answer. See, omatidium. Omatidium in arthropoda. There is no mention of anything about omatidium in, uh, omatidium in arthropoda in your syllabus. But this is the common point you have to remember. Okay? Fine. Okay. The respiratory organs of crustaceans. The respiratory organs of crustaceans. 
just uh, recall the general characters of arthropoda so that you can answer for this question very good the answer is both gills and the general surface now excretory product in an insect excretory product in an insect Nobody remember? Very good. The answer is the excretory product in an insect is uric acid. Okay. So when it comes to the insect, we know that it is placed under the phylum arthropoda. Just tell me, name the excretory organ which is present in the insects. Just tell me, name the excretory organ which is present in the insects. Very good. Malphigian tubule. Super. Clear? Yeah? Now, again, the unit of compound is nothing but an omatidium. Now, which one of these is good example of metamorphosis? I think, hope you all remember these. Uh, wait, option one. Let me read the options. Regeneration of broken tail of lizard. Growth and development of young one of Gangaru in its marsupium. Development of adult from pupa of insects. Hatching of maggot from the egg of the housefly. A good example for a metamorphosis process. Just think correctly and answer this question. See what we have studied in case of metamorphosis. Egg will be developed into hatch out into larval stage and that larval stages can be maggot, a caterpillar and it is. And from the larva, pupa stages will be developed. And from the pupa, the adult will be formed. Okay. So, we can easily eliminate these two options. A regeneration of broken tail of lizard and growth and development of young one of Gangaru in its marsupium. This is a post-embryonic stage. Of course, metamorphosis is also the post-embryonic growth. But how the process will be developing? Egg, larva, pupa and adult. So, we can scrutinize these two options. Okay, uh, this I, uh, The answer will be in this either of these options. Development of adult from the pupa of insects. Uh, but I have mentioned in some of there are there are different types of metamorphosis, right? Uh, a metabolus, uh, develop complete metabolus is there, incomplete metabolus is there, gradual metabolus is there. Does this pupil stages see all uh, types of metamorphosis process? Does this pupa stages will be involved in all the developmental stages? Pupa stages will be seen only in which type of metabol metabolism process? Yes. So, you have to understand this clearly. So, this can't be a good example for metamorphosis, right? In case the pupa stage is not present, again, this also a metamorphosis process. Correct. So, the answer will be hatching of maggot from the egg of the housefly. Is it clear? Shanti Karani, are you clear? Anjanelu, are you clear for this question? Say, so just tell me. Good. Fine. Now, Eggdesone regulates. Eggdesone regulates. First option is periodical shedding of epidermis of reptiles, eggdiasis of cuticle in adult animals, metamorphosis in insects, 
germination of sponges by gemmule. Ectisome is the one going to regulate which process? Obviously, a metamorphosis in insects. Okay, a periodical shedding of epidermis of reptiles, shedding of their body parts, it is related to somewhat a molting. Okay, but exosome is the one going to control the metamorphosis in insects. Clear? Now, germination of sponges by gemmule is related to the reproduction. It is which type of reproduction? Asexual reproduction. Clear? Now, a complete metamorphosis occurs in. A complete metamorphosis occurs in. Very good. Again, housefly. Just remember, so uh, what I am saying, the examples are very, very important. And this question proves that. Now, the most simple and commonest type of larva is Naplius larva, Zoya larva, Alima larva and Megalopa larva. Everybody answer. Everybody should be active. So exactly the answer will be Naplius larva. Clear? It is also known as the modified form of the Zoya larva. It is also the, so to answer this question, you have to remember what are all the uh, stages which has been developed from the Zoya larva. But the answer for this question is what? Very good. I am happy that you are, uh, remember, Alima larva. Okay, fine. Biting and chewing type of mouth parts occurs in which type of insects? Grasshopper, cockroach, cricket, all. Biting and chewing type of mouth parts occurs in. What about the cockroach and the cricket? All are the best example for biting and chewing type of mouth parts. Clear? Now, uh, this question is not necessary. A B venom. B venom is used in the treatment of B venom is used in the treatment of this comes under the topic useful and harmful insects. Okay, in that line, B venom is used in the treatment of arthritis, malaria, myopia, cholera. Very good. The answer will be arthritis. Now, the brain hormone in insect is secreted from. Brain hormone in insect is secreted from. Pituitary gland, neurosecretory glands of the brain, thoracic glands, nephridium. Name of the hormone is important. And which cell is the one going to Synthesize those hormone is also important. And what is the function of the hormone? These things are you have to read when it comes to the hormone. Very, very good. The answer will be neurosecretory cells of the brain. And what is it? Egdisone. Again, egdisone is brain hormone, uh, prothoraxic hormone, prothoraxic gland hormone and juvenile hormone. Which hormone? Egg-dying hormone is okay. Prothoraxic gland hormone. Now, tracheal system consists of Very good. All the above. When it comes to the arthropoda, 
the respiratory system is very well developed based on the animals it will vary okay so the spiracle tracheoles air sac trachea all these structure will be present in here in their respiratory system okay so all the above is the answer means of respiration in insects Just tell me, uh, let me explain this question. Means of respiration, when in case of insects, it is integuments. Okay. It is in integuments. I didn't exp uh, explain you in the class, uh, but uh, just remember means of respiration in case of insect is integuments. Scorpions are beneficial because they are used in biological control of insect. Pneumo, pneumo, uh, pneumoecological research and the immunological research all they go. Scorpions are also said to be beneficial. Very good. The answer will be all they go. So I have attached answer also here. Now, why larval stages is very, very important. We have studied that larval stages is a uh, uh, larval stages of crustacean. Why, we should, why we, it is necessary to read all those larval stages? Why? Because it is for the evidence of evolution. Okay. For the purpose of evolution from where it has been originated to know the origin and to know the similarities and differences, these larval stages are important to know so according to the biogenetic law of recapitalization theory of Hecate, see this can be asked in your question name of a theory recapitulation theory has been done by whom Heckel. just take down what this theory suggests is every organism during its development repeats to extent of its evolutionary history what is it during its development that is ontogeny during its development repeats to some extent its evolutionary history phylogeny. What does it simply means is ontogeny repeats its phylogeny. Phylogeny means evolutionary characters. Some of the things which has been considered one organism have been originated at this point. Now, due uh, uh, 1600 years after after some of years, this has been developed into a new year, newer organism, but there is a lot of changes. But of course, there will be the lot of changes. Some of the characteristic which is present in their origin, all will be what this question. Huh? The answer for this question is all the above. Kindly say me the question number. Tell me the question number please. See, the, for this question, the answer is option 4. And this question, the answer is all. Larval stages. Of. Is this? Can you please explain a little more, a little more clear? Okay, question now. There is no larval questions. 
Okay. Do you have any doubts on those question means you can ask me. Wait. Wait, I'll unmute. Uh... Unmute yourself and tell me. Ma'am, ma'am, good morning. Yes, good In morning. Pre previous question paper, then uh, larval stages, uh, uh, major significance is uh, mm -hmm. change, evolution, this type of answers given. See, 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 that is different. Okay, you can mute yourself. Let me explain you. Wait. Here, what is the question? Another word for metamorphosis. Another term for metamorphosis. It is not, see, metamorphosis is different. Larval stages is different. See, metamorphosis, just egg is converted into larva. Larva is from uh, converted into pupa and pupa to an adult form. But we, what we are studying now is why larval stages is important. Metamorphosis is a whole process and we are studying why larval stages is important. Good. Okay. Even it is a small doubt, it is also important to clear. Okay. So now what is the reason? Okay, let me continue this. See, initially one organism have been developed here. After some of years, let's take after 1016, uh, 1600 years ago, it has been completely different from their origin. But of course, it has a different from their own structure. Some of the characters which is present during their during the time of origin, the same characters will be present at that point also. So that is what ontogeny repeats its phylogeny. So the in the, the the evolutionary characters will keep on keep on transferring from till today till date it has been transforming some of their characteristics so it is very uh, it it has been um, no only when we know the larval stage clear now in other words we can say successive stages of individual development corresponds with successive adult ancestors in the line of evolutionary descent. The same thing have been explained. See, some of the characters we have inherited from their, from our father and mother, okay? But some of the child, it is uh, totally different from their own parents, but they are resembling some of their characters like their grandparents, if not their grandparents, from their great-grandparents. Okay, like in the same way, this also happening. And due to this occurrence in the development of all crustaceans, the nauplius was previously regarded to be as represent rep, regarded to be representing the ancestral form of crustacean. It means what? It resembles all the characteristics which is present in the primitive crustacean. Now, the other larval forms shows stages of evolution of the higher crustaceans from the nauplius like the ancestors, which means what? From the ancestors, some of the characters have been inherited from the nauplius, uh, inherit to the nauplius. From the nauplius, it has been converted to the metanauplius larva. And from the nauplius, it also converted to the protozoa larva. Okay, And from the protozoa, it has been converted to the zoa larva. For the pro uh, for the metanauplius larva, who is his, uh, who is its ancestor? Nauplius larva is considered as an ancestor to the metanauplius. Oh, this is okay. This is what I'm I'm trying to explain. The old idea of recapitulation stands greatly modified nowadays, and the crustacean larva forms now regarded to be the larval reversions to their types, much simpler than the crustacean ancestors. What they are saying now is the crustacean larva, what we have studied now is they are all a simpler form than their own ancestor form. Now, the, why this point, this is all not necessary. This point is necessary. The larval stages are useful for finding out the homologies and affinities among the various groups. 
which means what the what are all the characteristics we have mentioned in the larval stages of crustaceans it is used for us to compare different phylums with their own larval stages and when when why we have to find the similarities and differences means again we have to place them in a correct phylum how the classification classification taxonomical classification class platy helminthes so all the worms which are seen in flat flat like structure everybody will everything will be placed under the uh, phylum platy helminthes and all the worms which are rounding their nature which all has been uh, placed under the nemet helminthes those who have those worms which which has segments within it and those worms are placed under the phylum annelida all these are happened only because of the evolution only because of comparison only because of identifying all the similarities and different uh, differences we are placed in the correct classification okay clear this is why we are studying these larval stages now and again peripatetes it is not in your syllabus but you have to know it is a connecting link between the annelida and the arthropoda and because only we find only we read the characteristics of the characteristic nature of the peripatetes we have come into conclusion it is placed between the annelida and arthropoda and why we have placed it under this annelida and arthropoda means this peripatetes have some of the characteristics which are similar to the phylum annelida and it also possess some of the characteristics which seen in the phylum arthropoda okay so it has a characteristics both in the phylum annelid both uh, similar to the phylum annelida as well as the arthropoda so we are saying the annelida it is not directly converted the complete structure into the arthropoda we know that see what are all the animals from the porifera only they are converted into the cell enterotens okay only some of the organisms which is present in the cell enterota that is the one develop their characteristics and converted into the platy helminthes and from the platy helminthes some of the worms changes their structure and they have been con uh, converted to the nematodes and from the nematodes some of the worms will be converted or gain their structures and from the phylum it has been developed into the annelida and from the annelida it has been developed into the arthropoda so for each and every organism for for each and every phylum which has been converted from one phylum to the another phylum one particular organism will act as a connecting link in that line this peripatetes is the one act as a connecting link between annelida as well as the arthropoda clear clear everyone why we are saying this peripatetes as a connecting link between annelida and arthropoda hope you are clear peripatetes it is not in your syllabus if you have interest you can read it clear yeah? now we are going to study about the sericulture what is sericulture culturing of the silk worm okay culturing of the silk okay culturing of the silk from the worm okay and what is the worm we can say we we can call them as a silk worm sericulture is the cross sorry it is an wait sericulture it is the process of cultivating silk worms and extracting silk from them which means what we are going to cultivate silk worms by cultivating all those silk worms we are developing the silk worm and from the silk worm will produce the silk okay and we are going to extract the silk from the silk worm this is called as the sericulture and the most uh, common silk worm is nothing but the bombyx mori okay this bombyx mori is the commonly used silk worm species in the sericulture unit yeah now there are other types of silk worms also there eri silk worm nuga silk worm and the tarsier silk worm they are also used in the cultivation or the protection of wild silks okay this is what what is sericulture is now how this silk is made up of this silk is made up of 
to proteins important question the silk has been made up from the two different proteins and that is nothing but sericin and the fibroin okay sericin and the fibroin 80% of the silk fiber is made up of this particular protein called the fibroin and the remaining 20% will be made by the sericin so the major protein seen in the silk silk fiber is fibroin okay fibroin is a protein it is composed mainly in the silk fiber 20% it is made up of sericin this can be asked in the question the presence of pigments such as xanthophyll in the sericin layer of the fiber imparts color to the silk of course it it comprises only 20% it is the one giving color to those particular silk okay see in the silk there are two different types of proteins what is that sericin and the fibroid this sericin is 80% and this uh, sorry this fibroin is at 80% this sericin is 20% even though it com it contributes less uh, less percentage when it comes to the pro makeup of uh, silk this uh, this 20 percent is the one giving pigment to the silk clear now this is the important slide you have to remember what are all the types of silk and what are all the color they are giving and all these color are given by the which protein sericin the pigment which is present in the sericin in case of mulberry cell, it is going to give yellow or green color. Airy cell, creamy white or brick red. Tarsal cell, it is of copper brown. Muga cell, it is in golden in color. And what are all the process followed in the sericulture? There are, there are three different types seen in the sericulture unit. And the first one is mauriculture. See, this can also be asked in the question. Mauriculture means cultivation of mulberry leaves the silk has to the silk worm has to feed on something okay so their main feeding main feed is mulberry leaves so we have to culture those mulberry leaves and the process of cultivating this mulberry leaves is called as the mori culture okay and silk worm rearing rearing means promoting the growth of silk worm we have to cultivate the silk worm and we have to cultivate the some of the food for to feed the silk worm and that is nothing but the mulberry leaves called it, calling as calling it as the moriculture and silk reeling the extraction of silk developments after the silk worm feed on all these mulberry leaves the silk has to be produced by the silk worm and we have to extract those silk uh, silk filaments from the Silk worm. This is called as a silk reeling. I'm explaining you once again. See, we have to cultivate the silk worm and we have to give some food to that particular worm to grow in their structure. And what is their main source of food? This mulberry leaves. So, the process of cultivating this mulberry leaves is nothing but moriculture. And the silk worm, when feed on this mulberry leaves, they grow in size and they cover themselves inside the cocoon. While convert while well, they covering their themselves within their cocoons, they are nothing but the silk filaments. And we have to extract the silk filaments from the silk worm. This process is said to be as the silk reeling. Now, the silk filaments, after it has been extracted from the silk worm, they have to form them as a thread. Now, this thread, it is going to undergo the uh, going to form a yarn this process is called as yarning we are going to see in the upcoming slides now moriculture moriculture we know that this is the main source of food for the silkworm and it refers to the cultivation of mulberry plants whose leaves are used as a silkworm feed okay and this mulberry leaves can be developed in three different methods one is cultivation from the seeds. Consider this as a pot or, uh, or the land. If we uh, feed, if we sow the seeds, and the mulberry will develop, uh, mulberry leaves will be developed. Root grafting, stem grafting. If we consider this as a mulberry tree, okay, consider this as a mulberry tree. Consider this as a root. Okay, this is a root. If we cut a one root and the grafting method and if we locate those graft in the area where we have to need, uh, need to cultivate this mulberry leaf means if we cut the root and sow it in the uh, 
a necessary area or the perfect location, the, the mulberry leaves will be developed. Again, the mulberry tree will be developed. Again, if we cut the stem here, if we cut the stem and we can also locate wherever we want, again, the mulberry leaves or plants will be developed. So, it can be developed into three different methods. Cultivation from the seeds or from the root graft method or from the stem grafting method. But what is the most commonly used method is stem grafting. Stem grafting is the most commonly used method because of their size. Uh, be, uh, when compared to these two, it can develop very larger. Now, these cutting may be directly planted or first kept in the nurseries and then can be transplanted from the, uh, from the nursery to the field area. Okay, this is about a cultivation mechanism. Now, the mulberry leaves can be harvested from the plants via the following methods. See, for cultivation, there are three different methods and how we are going to harvest those plants or there are different methods. Leaf picking, branch cutting, top shoot harvesting. Leaf picking means we have to cut, cut the in, uh, leaves by an individual by our hand. And the branch cutting means removal of entire branch and top shoot cutting means removal of mulberry shoot tops. These are all the points we are going to we are going to follow when we harvest those mulberry plants. Now, how we are going to rear the silkworm? Now, in sericulture, the silkworm rearing process begins with the laying of eggs. Okay, see the worm is going to lay some of the eggs. Okay, now, how many number of eggs can be seen? Approximately 300 to 500 eggs. From one female silk moth, these eggs are then disinfected with the help of 2% two, uh, 2 of formalin solution. We have to protect this eggs from degeneration. For that, to prevent from this uh, degeneration, we are going to spread some of the disinfectant. Generally, 2% of formalin solution. It is a biological preservative. Okay, now after that, a feeding bed is prepared on a rearing tray by sprinkling shopping mulberry leaves into it. Okay, now it has to be placed in a perfect tray and the tray consists of mulberry leaves. Once the egg has been hatched, uh, hatched into the larva, this larval stage is the one going to feed on those mulberry leaves. The hatched larvae are transferred into this tray. Once the eggs has been hatched into the larva, the larva has been transported into the tray which consists of mulberry leaves. And the larva, see, how, what is the name of the process? The hatched larva is transferred into the tray is said to be as brushing. What is the process? Brushing. Okay. In order to maintain humidity, foam stripes are soaked in water and placed on the tray. Okay, and the most important point you have to remember is name the process where the hatched larva has been transformed into the tray. It is said to be as brushing. Now, the larva initially have a good appetite, which means what? It have a lots and lots of hunger. So that the larva is said to be as a voracious feeder. It keeps on eating, eating, eating. That is the only job performed by the larva. Okay. As they grow, once they attain a particular size, their appetite slowly diminishes until their active stage. See, once the larval stages has been developed into one adult. Or that they, uh, after this larva grow in their size, they do not feed Okay, they lost their hunger. They lost their appetite. Okay, it lost their uh, it lost their appetite. At this stage, the silkworm eats enthusiastically until it's finally until its final feeding stage. Now, after it attains maturity, the larva begins to searching for hospitable places to begin their pupation. Okay, see so initially it is in the egg. After the egg, it has to develop into one larval stage. When the larva has been hatched out, it has been transformed into the tray with the, which consists of what? Mulberry leaves. The larva has very much appetite. It is going to keep on feeding the larva, feeding the 
mulberry leaves present in the tree um, pre present in that particular tree after it undergoes some of their structure it is ready to ready for their pupation which means what it cover themselves within the as within the case secreted by the worm okay now at this stage the body of the silkworm shrinks okay shrinks and becomes translucent and these mature larvae now trapped themselves in a cocoon by secreting saliva from two salivary glands see how it has been wrapped themselves inside the cocoon means only with the help of their saliva saliva consists of saliva has been secreted from the salivary glands present on their head region this saliva solidifies becomes cells when it comes in contact with the air okay everybody clear with this with this point see once it has been uh, lar once the larva attains uh, in their uh, attain their mature stage this uh, larva ready to uh, ready to convert themselves into the stage called the pupa and this process is called the pupation now this how they have been wrapped themselves wrap their own body within their cocoon means it secretes saliva from the salivary glands if the salivary glands which is present in their head region now this saliva when it comes contact with the air it becomes solidified and that saliva when solidified then we can call them as a silk okay now the cocoon is spun in 2 to 3 days okay Two to three days. However, some varieties of silkworm can take up to four days to spin their cocoons. Clear? Now, now the sil the, the pupa stage has been seen here. Now that this will be covered themselves into the cocoon. Inside the pupa, inside the case, the pupa, the larval stages can be seen. Inside the cocoons, now what is the process they are going to do means the larva undergo the metamorphosis and they turn into the pupae. Okay, the process is said to be as the pupation. Okay, the larva has been converted into the pupa. The harvesting of silk from these cocoons is the final stage of the sericulture. so what is the sericulture means the pupa does not converted into an adult form we are going to rear those silk in their pupation stages itself so this is an important area this is the final stage of the sericulture first the pupa inside the cocoon are killed by boiling so this is why some of the ethics can also be in the in the practice of buddhism they are go they are avoid to wear those silk sarees because they we are we are getting silk only by killing many organisms so it is unethical according to them so many people will uh, refuse to wear those silk uh, silk uh, cloths why because only by killing many silk forms we are getting to uh, we are get the cloth they, we are getting the fabric called this silk okay so it is unethical to someone so that's why they are refuse to Uh, via that, and that process, that that is the process happening in the silk railing. Okay, now hope you are prefer. Oh, you you are going to prefer this silk. I think I guess right. Now first the pupae inside the cocoon are killed by the boiling the cocoon and exposing into the steam under under dry heat. This process is said to be as the stiffling. This conversion of the pupa to the um steam and dry heat this process is called the stiffling now the silk filaments are removed from the dead cocoon okay the silk cocoons after it has been dead after the process of stiffling now we find that the we remove the dead cocoon and that process is called as the reeling when the cocoon are placed in the boiled water for approximately 15 minutes the adhesion of the silk thread reduces enabling enabling the se uh, separation of individual filaments and these filaments are twisted into the thread with the help of a series of guides and pulleys and this pro the silk is again reboiled into the reboiled in order to improve its luster to improve its texture okay so one thread of silk contains approximately 50 silk filaments 
However, over 900 meters of filament can be obtained from the single cocoon. So, you have to know the importance of one particular cocoon. It has the capacity to give 90, 900 meters of the filament from one single cocoon. Now, this is the complete process of the silk, re silk reeling and this silk reeling is the final stage in the sericulture. What are all the challenges in case of sericulture? What are all the challenges faced by this particular uh, sericulture unit? Those who, uh, those who entrepreneurship, the, the, mainly they were called the entrepreneurship who run the sericulture unit. What are all the challenges faced by them? Mainly the disease. So the most, 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 most important area, the brain disease is the one related to the disease, which is going to cause the silk, uh, which is going to affect the silk one. Okay, and this brain disease mainly target the egg. Okay, they are going to infect the egg, resulting in the death before hatching of the larva. Any larva affected by this disease develop dark spots, become lethargic. They are not going to convert into the pupa stage. They are not going to undergo the process called pupation. Now, the viral infections, many viral infections also going to affect the larval body. Now, other viral infections, they are giving, they are called the cytoplasmic polyhedrosis. When the larva got infection by this particular uh, virus, and if they are with, if they undergo the sim symptom called cytoplasmic polyhedrosis, means we have studied larva is a voracious feeder, they have to feed. They have to feed. If it, if this larva affected by this particular disease means they lost its appetite. If they lost its appetite, the further process will be severely affected. So next, the muscaldine infection, again, an important infection going to affect the silkworm. Particularly, it is the fungi. This is also an important thing. It makes the larva to die. It is fatal in nature for the larval form of the silkworm. Now, some mice will also produce a toxic substances and this toxic substances has the potential to kill those silkworms. That's all about the sericulture. If you have any doubts, means you can ask or, or else you can solve this question. The cultivation of mulberry leaves is called Don't get confused with uh, um, Lalita uh, with respect to the sericulture and mariculture. Culturing of silkworm is said to be as the silk sericulture. Okay. Culturing of or cultivating the mulberry leaves is said to be as a mariculture. So this answer for this question is mariculture. Now what is sericulture? These are all very easy questions. So they, uh, don't take much time. Yes, silkworm. Okay, now. Okay, I'll post this questions in their group. Uh, it is in the PPT, so you have uh, you solve these questions. Okay, if you have any doubts, having any doubts means you can ask me. Please be on time tomorrow, same time. Okay, if you have uh, no doubts, you can leave the class by now. Thank you. Thank you.